All right, my crosscut sled. Um, I use this thing constant, particularly in cabinetry and stuff like that. One of the things that allows me, now mine's pretty big. Um, this one is 28, uh, 51. But the thing that it allows me to do is it allows me to take fairly wide panels. I can usually take about a 22, 24 inch panel and cross cut it. The other thing it allows me to do is set up stops for repetitive cuts. Now, the key to building one is very simple. If you look, can we get a shot right here? All I've got is this is a piece of three quarter wide by three eighths thick. This happens to be a piece of maple. But any good hardwood will do. And you wanna make sure it moves through your miter slides well, now remember we were talking about that outfeed table. If you have an outfeed table and you have to build one, make sure you take a dado and make a, some slots in it so that your miter gauge and whatever can run through. Now in this case, this one the, uh, will drop down so I can move through. Now, they do a super nice job, but again, building it, you got the two strips of maple I set the fence, I set the slide down on it. I make sure that the slide is square. I make sure the fence is square to the blade. Then I make sure the, the slide is square to the fence. Then I go through and I drill. Now in my case, I took some short staples or a brad nailer. Works really nice. It just pop, nail the little uh, strips to it not letting anything move. And if you don't have that, you can just simply use a little finishing nail and just get them attached so that they, and you want to do it while it's on here because that puts everything right in perfect alignment. Now, one of the things you want to do if you make a cut with this cross cut sled, particularly if you have a stop set, you want to pass all the way through and remove the material. You do with a stop set, you do not want to try to come backwards on it. If you move a little bit, it can pinch and it can maybe kick back on you a little bit. Okay, now one of the other things you're going to notice. Make sure you got a tall enough fence in the back you don't saw your, your uh, sled into. And on this one, I've got a pretty heavy piece back here so the blade can come through and my hand's not gonna engage it. Works nice. Let me show you another one real quick. This will show you a little bit more of how it's made. This is a quick one. I needed to cut some 45 degree material, some stuff on 45 degrees, so I simply threw a little fence together. Same thing. And I can put, these were some short pieces, and you see here I just took a, I put a auxiliary fence on it where I needed to be a little bit longer, and clamped a stop block to it and I went. Now, I want to talk about, even though we're still, we're on the sled, I want to talk about left tilt, right tilt table saw. A left tilt, when you angle the blade, it's going to tilt to the left. That's definitely my choice, beyond a shadow of a doubt. And the reason for that is, if you look carefully, Let's say I'm ripping this at 45 degrees.
Notice where the off fall is. It, it, away, it fell down. If I have a right tilt, then the off fall is going to be falling down on the blade. Make sense? I don't like that at all. So left tilts are a little bit more expensive usually, but that's the one you want. That's, that's I mean, everything I, I think one time I owned a right tilt, but not for long. You know, I mean, if you're not doing miters and whatever, I mean, they're fine, they work. It's just that I don't care for a right tilt any way, shape, or form. Uh, just my opinion. Okay, we're going to come back and we're going to look at gluing up panels. Okay, let's talk a little bit about gluing up panels. Now, you know, when I'm gluing up panels, um, I want done. Get in, get out. But there's some, over the years, there's some things I've come to figure out with this thing. One is, and a little later we're going to be looking at the drum sander. And in my case, I'm fortunate enough to have one that I can pretty much get pretty good sized panels through. I'm going to say this, and I'll repeat myself when we get to that drum sander of any single piece of equipment that I've ever bought or ever owned, nothing improved my woodworking more than a drum sander. They're just invaluable in my opinion. Now, with a drum sander, I can abrasive plane and level and flatten, do all of those things. But I realize a lot of people don't have one. But in my world, when I'm gluing something up, I'm going to glue it up heavy, thick. You know, I mean, a lot of times I'll take it right from being skim planed and glue it up. It depends upon the thickness I'm going for. You know, but in this case, I'm about seven eighths. And, you know, if I want three quarters, but I can also probably get this through my planer. If you've got a lunchbox, probably not. But I could also glue this panel up in two sections, then lightly put it through the planer to a final dimension. Then when I glue it back together, I've only got one glue seam to contend with. If you're of the unfortunate few who have to get your wood pre-dimensioned, where you've got to glue a panel up and it's got to be level and flat and everything, then a biscuit joiner is going to really help you. Now everybody knows what they are and a little later we'll be looking at it. But in as much as gluing a panel and using a biscuit joiner for additional strength, I don't. I've, not with the modern day adhesives. I've ran test after test and I'm going to be honest with you, I just, I can't see any difference than just a good old fashioned edge glue with a good, with a good glue. Um, I'll also tell you something else too. I'm not real polite when it comes to gluing. Um, actually, you might even call me a slob, but I'm not. I'm getting a lot of nodding like this from behind the camera. But I never had a joint come apart either. Don't starve the joints. Now, the other thing when you're gluing up a panel, now, you know, there's the old. You, you'll see it out here everywhere. People talk about you want to do. This one, the growth rings are going this way. So you want the next one going down. You want them up, down, up, down. And that's so that that helps to control cupping somewhat. And it does work. However, if you're doing figured woods, that's not the case. If you're doing a piece of tiger maple or flame birch or, or, or any, any figured wood, you want to keep the same face forward. So you start flipping and flopping, when you get to finishing, you're going to have a mess. It's not going to look too good. But this is just some white maple. 
Now the other thing I prefer to do is when I'm doing it, if you look, we've got some cathedral, cathedral green. Got it here as well. I always prefer to keep my grain running the same direction. And I'm going to move my wood around and try to get the best match that I can. Now what I'm looking at right here, I've got this grain is kind of running out that way. The rest of them are pretty straight. So what I'm going to do is I'm looking at my glue line and I'm trying to line up the best I can so that it looks like one board. I'll leave that one on the outside. And that looks pretty decent. Now the other thing I do, I never glue to size. Meaning, I mean, I see guys who will, they need a panel 22 inches long. They cut everything to 22 and they're fighting and wiggling, trying to get that end just perfect. Now, at the table saw, you saw the crosscut slit. We size it after it's glued up. And particularly if we got a drum sander, once we glue it up and we level everything, that's the time to cut it to size. Not now. It's just too much, too much room for error. Now when it comes to the actual gluing process, now I'm going to tell you up front, it, uh, it's too below outside and all my craft paper is over in another building. So I'm not going to go get it. <laughs> Meaning, I'm going to get some glue on my table. If any of you have ever been to my shop or ever get a chance to come by, you'll realize this is not the first time that's ever happened. Now, comes the old question, do you put glue on both sides? Well, that depends on how much glue you put. All right. Now, my favorite glue, Type Bond 3. I like the way it holds. I like how quick it sets. And in the finishing realm, it dries to a hard glue line. I like that. That's going to finish better than a yellow glue, which will dry to a little bit more pliable line. Yeah, like I said, when it comes to glue, I'm a neat freak. If you got a coat of glue on there, about like a coat of latex paint on a wall that you apply with a roller, you're in pretty good shape. Now, you notice I don't have any calls, meaning something on the ends, edges to in case I get a clamp mark. Well, the reason there's two reasons for that. One, I got hard maple. The second reason is, is that I'm going to be trimming the side, so I'm not too worried about it. I saw a very popular woodworking show where the gentleman laid his boards down on a table and put a clamp across them like this. That's not good in my opinion. Now if you look right here on this end, you can see I'm out of level right here a little bit. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to put a little bit of pressure on it. Now if I can't get that out 
relatively easy, I'm not going to worry about it. That's the reason I left this heavy. Because if I have to force this into position, I'm putting too much pressure. I'm, 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 you know, I'm gluing something up that's under a strain or stress. A damp rag. See, I ain't got to be real particular. I just don't want something that's going to interfere with me later when I go to process it. Now, I see something already I don't like. Can you see this? Look under here. Look right here in this corner. And look at the other corner. I'm up off my clamp. I don't want that. That means I'm actually going to glue this up into a cup. I want them down flat on these clamps as best I can get them. And I want a level table to glue it up on. There we go. I'm down. All right, let it dry. Now I got a little glue on my table. Well, that ain't nothing a damp cloth won't take care of. Um, every now and then, if I have to, get a little glue glob on here. I take a little scraper and knock it off. But I'm gone. To my benches, uh, yeah, I know everybody out there uses everything in the world. We've got General Finishes Armor Seal. Any good polyurethane oil on it, throw a coat of wax on it now and then. The glue won't stick. Pops right off. Don't worry about it. That's how I glue up panels my chop saw. Well this poor thing has been modified more times than I can think. Um, back when I just had a standard chop saw this used to have a big back on it and it goes down into a chute and that was my sawdust catch. When I got a slider I couldn't do that anymore without coming way out into the room. So if I'm doing a lot on the back of it right here I can stick a shot back and I do. But normally, just for a quick chop, I don't worry about it. We, again, everything rolls, we've got a receptacle behind it, and we're very mindful of that to keep sawdust and whatever out of it. That's a big thing. But this is a jet, obviously. It's a 12-inch compound slider. Um, it's done a pretty good job. Before this, I had a Delta. No, a DeWalt, right? Yeah. Um, you know, as long as they'll set up and tune up, they're good. The jet has a little bit, had an issue. I had to adjust the fence out a little bit. Uh, I'm not wanting to go back and leaving just a little teeny ta tab in the back, but I got that. Now the other thing with mine, and I don't even know that they make them anymore, if you can get them. This is a Beesmeyer fence that I've got going down it, and it's got to stop. But, you know, there's videos out there. I mean, you can make one. That's really nice. One of the things I like is I like having a stop. I like being able to set a measurement and index from a specific point. It just makes repetitive cutting, you know, so much more accurate. I mean, you know, if I need to cut 10 pieces, 20 pieces, I can set it and just go. Now, again, setting it up, you know, each one's a little different, but you got to make sure it's square and you got to make sure that the blade is square to the surface. Um, again, on this one, this, this is, I don't know what, this is a Freud something. And I've got it, I've got a uh, forest and 
Freud as good as the force. That simple. Um, so it's done pretty good. One of the things you got to be careful of on a compound miter. People are of the opinion that you work run it like this. You go into the wood. No. For the same reason, a radial arm saw, the teeth on this thing are coming forward. So if you've got a wider piece, it can lunge forward on you. The way to use a compound miter is backwards. Bring it out, plunge down, and go backwards. Now, this board has got a pretty bad wane in it. Remember we talked about that where the board is running like this? If you're trying to cut rough cut something that hasn't been straight lined, and again, I'm going to repeat myself in that the shorter you can cut something, the easier it is to straight line and work with. But if you get in a situation, and I know you're not going to be able to see this on camera, I can stick my finger in between the fence and this board. It's got that much wane in it. So here's what's going to happen. If I try to chop this, if I come out here and I start going back, that board is going to start closing in on itself and it's going to pinch and it's going to jerk this thing forward. The best way to do it, and again, this is why you always overcut, is turn it over to where you can get the fence up against the board up against the fence. But here's another trick. Chop it. Don't slide it. And when you do, here's what you're going to do. First chop is in the back. That allows this piece of wood to flex and allows it to go back. Second chop finishes it off. You're not running it. You're making a plunge cut then another plunge cut so that the wood didn't have a chance to pinch on you. That's the way you handle that one. Um, again, this saw has served well. But if you go back to the table saw where we showed you that little miter or the little 45 degree sled we made, if you're cutting small miters on small moldings, one of the things with these bigger saw, these bigger compound miter or any chop saw, miter saw, whatever you want to call it, is they're a little bit aggressive. And a little small molding, it can chip out pretty quick on you. Using it on the little sled is a whole lot safer and very, very accurate. The other thing with that little sled that I probably forgot to mention was that when you make your initial cut in there, the thing it does is it's, let me grab it very quickly. One of the things I really like about a little miter slide is that when I'm, I can see exactly where I'm cutting. I mean, I know the blade's gonna pass right through there, so I, if I've got a mark, I can set the mark right where I want, and I know that's where it's gonna wind up. It makes, you know, just easier to, easier to align and see what you're doing. Um, but on larger stuff, this does a great job. I mean, it does really nice. I've cut some, I've cut a lot of wood with this saw, a lot of wood. Um, but I will tell you this, being able to set up a fence, if you can, is a really nice thing where you got a stop block on it. That's, that, that's just almost invaluable to me. Okay, miters. Now I realize we touched on this with the miter saw, chop saw, and on the table saw. But I thought I'd expand on it just a little bit. Now one of the first things I do, I'm running an 80 tooth fine cut blade. Now again, you got to make sure your saws adjusted properly. But no matter what I'm doing, in particular, you know, the difference between the table saw and the chops, the miter saw, chop saw, you're not going to be able to do crown molding on a table saw very easily. Chop saw no issue. The easiest way I've ever found is just set your crown up against your fence exactly like it's going to sit on the ceiling or whether 
it's going to be on a piece of furniture or what. Make a plunge cut, you got it. Now, here's a trick. Because saw blades can sometimes just give you a little shimmy there, particularly if you're cutting something hard and heavy, what I'll do is I'll cut it, leave it about a sixteenth of an inch long, and then I just barely shave it. That sneak up on it thing. Works great. Now the difference is, if you're cutting an inside crown, stand it up just like it's going to go. Now I know some of you are going to look at this and say, I don't know about that. It actually works pretty well. Stand it up. Don't do the slide. Just make a straight plunge cut. And you're not going to have any issue. Inside corners, whatever you want to do. Now, I also mentioned that something like this little molding, a fine small molding, chop saw can be a little aggressive on it, no matter how fine the blade. I've had small moldings like this chip out. I've had them just kind of break just because that the inertia of that big blade coming down, the way it cuts, it's, it's a little iffy. But table saw, that's a different story. We'll look at that just a second. Now when I'm making a crown for a piece of furniture, I'm real bad about making a molding. It goes on the top. This is the crown I made, it's just a cove. And I usually make mine where it sits over top of the case. I do that for expansion and contraction or whatever, which we'll talk about a little later. When I make a crown like this, that's just a simple set it up. No different because of the way it's sitting here, it's going to automatically make your corner correct. The other nice thing about a chop saw is that you can sneak up on it. Meaning, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm going to inform you. I know everything you make is perfectly square. Well, mine's not supposed to be, but ain't exactly sometimes. Well, the thing you there's nothing says that a miter it's supposed to be 245 degrees but that doesn't always necessarily happen so if you got a case or something's a little not quite right what you want to do rather than waste a bunch of molding is the thing with the chop saw is you know you can go back to 44 and a half degrees or 45 and a half or 46 you can kind of fudge that a little bit. The way I do it, I'm going to cut my first cut. It's going to be a 45. And then I'm going to take a scrap and, and play with my angle until I make sure it's mating and fitting my case or ceiling or whatever I'm doing. I don't use my good stuff. Something to bear in mind. Let's go to the table saw and take a look at this. Again, because of the chop saw being able to lay the crown up and come down, that just works so well for a miter. You would just be hard pressed to design something that would allow you to do it on a table saw effectively and easily. But just for straight up miters, picture frames, whatever, they're great. Again, this is going back to our little jig here. Now, if I've got a tall molding like this, then no. I'm going to run into an issue unless I can get the blade up high enough. In which case, because this was done for just some small moldings, I wouldn't be able to do it. But for these little small moldings of just being able Now just because of the way the blade is coming into the material, 
you don't get near the chip out on a little shoulder or something like that and it'll give you a really nice tight little miter works very 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 nice but again use that same sneak up on it thing cut it come back trim it a little bit and you're good okay again small moldings and whatever I really like the table saw and you know even small boxes it's just so much more effective I've often said of any one single piece of equipment that made the biggest difference in my woodworking, it would have to be a drum sander, bar nine. Um, you know, if you're using figured woods or anything, the thing with a drum sander is you can just get it so flat and clean and, and nice. You don't have issues with tear out. You don't have snipe. Uh, the comment I've made, I said I would rather if I had a choice between a planer and a, and a sander, I'd rather have the sander. Because I can simply take, I mean, I can take 36 grit, 24 grit sandpaper, which is pretty, they're, they're pretty rough. So I can, I can remove a lot of wood fairly quickly. But you have to remember it is a sander. It's not a planer. It's, it, they're, they're much slower. But I mean, I can take and sand material down and make veneers out of it, anything else. Uh, and what we talked about in the planer segment, twist and stuff like that, they're just great. Which one do you buy? The biggest one you can afford. Uh, now, I will tell you this. We've had the dual drum, and I just kind of prefer the single drum. I don't need that. I am going to tell you, you're going to see a lot of them out here that's like, you know, 1632 or 2244 or whatever. And these are the cantilevered ones, meaning they're open on one end. And I've had them, and I'm going to be very honest with you. My experience has shown that they don't do it. And, and the theory is that you put it through and you run and you do half of a panel, then you turn around and put the other half through and do the other half of the panel. Uh, I've not seen guys have a lot of success with that. So my contention is, and my preference is, is number one, it's a closed end machine. But the other thing is, even if you're using one of the open end, you know, let's assume you're doing a 40 inch top. Well, you know, you can glue it up in sections that you can put through as one piece and then glue them together. You only have one glue seam to deal with. Uh, but I mean, just flat, straight, there's nothing, there's, I just don't think there's anything out there much better than that. I'm also going to tell you this too, a lot of people mistakenly think that they eliminate sanding and they don't. Um, you know, particularly you, t and you have a thing called burn. Um, this is a burn right here. Now, let me explain what this comes from. This comes from the mineral in the wood getting hot and building up, and it creates a burn. If you scrape this off, you notice I'm just kind of picking it off. And you notice it's loose. You know why it's loose now? Because it's sprayed with crud cutter. It's just like cleaning your blades. It's a pitch. It's what it is. The same thing gets on your saw blades. And the reason you get this is, is number one, is going too fast for the material, or too slow, I mean too fast, and trying to take too much off. The finer the papers, more so. If you're doing something, woods that burn easily, cherry, maple, uh, white oak can be tenacious. But they can all do it. But the bottom line to it is, is we rarely go past 120 because we're going to take a random orbit and clean it up. Um, but in, And the other thing is I do is that I like gluing up heavy, just like the panel we glued up that's laying right here. We glued it up heavy 
Now we process it down, we're ready to use it. Um, when it comes out, it will be flat, level, perfect. Now this one actually set around enough and I let it get a little bit of a cup in it because I wanted to show you. Now what I've done, I uh, scraped my glue off, but you can see I'm not perfectly level in it, here and here, but I'm heavy enough that it doesn't matter. So I'm just going to take something like a piece of chalk, draw across it. Now one of the things you want is you want good dust collection. I've got a horse and a half here, and I've got another horse and a half down there, but I've got two outlets on this. Now what I want you to do is to back this segment up and watch as I put it through. I purposely, in two of the passes, took too much. Now this particular sander, this is a 37 inch, but it's got a thing called a sand smart. And it's, an, it's a sensor that slows it down, okay? You don't want to hog it that fast. Now, could you, this is 120. But as you've seen, it didn't take that long. Uh, if I had rough wood, I could use it at, you know, a 36, then jump to an 80, then jump to a 120. What I found is with the drum sanders, you can pretty much skip a grit. Um, at this point, at 120, 
I could go through and very lightly, and again, I'm going to use it very lightly, hit it with some 150. Now, one of the things that a drum sander is going to do that a planer is not so much is it's going to produce some heat. So be very, very careful. Once I've kind of got it coming down flat and level, typically what I'll do is do one side, flip it, do the other, alternating back and forth, okay? That kind of keep, and heat dries out wood. So keeping the heat as low as I can, as minimal as I can, and when I'm done, put it in a plastic bag to keep it from cupping or warping, okay? Um, I'm gonna say this again. I'm gonna repeat myself. Nothing I know of will help you in processing your material better and nicer. I mean, you know, you can glue up doors, um, you know, and put put a frame and just hope put them together enough that you ride them through. It'll flatten the level them. Uh, we just use it constant. I mean, you 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 can process your wood as just as straight and flat, just beautiful. Um, Again, this isn't a fancy panel, but it's flat, clean. It's ready to go to work. Now I would have to do the other side, obviously. And I should have did the flip back and forth, but I just wanted you to see what it's going to do and how to take a panel that used to look like that, or worse, and clean it up. And remember when we glued this up, you know, we had areas in here that we were off a little bit. Um, but by leaving it thick, it didn't matter. And we didn't put the panel under a whole bunch of stress by forcing those boards flat. You know, now, I mean, everything's sound and solid, glued up, slick and flat. Yeah, there's just so many things you need a bandsaw for. Um, and you can buy the little bench tops and whatever. It depends upon your size and, you know, what it is you're looking to do. Now, but some things you need to understand a little bit about a bandsaw. When they talk about, for example, a 14-inch bandsaw or a 10-inch bandsaw, what they're talking about is the distance from the blade to the back. It has nothing to do with the height. Blade to the back. Now, this is a Powermatic. Uh, we, have a, we have what's called a riser on it. What's a riser do? A riser, exactly what it implies. It makes it taller. Why do you need it taller? Well, if you do what's called resawing, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The taller it is, the better. But there's some things when you're, you want a good set of guides. You know, th these are a set of Carter roller bearings. That's just one we like. You, and when you're bandsawing something, you want to make sure that you have a good blade and it's properly tuned. And there's a lot of videos out there on how to do that. But one of the things you want to do is you want to make sure that you're down slightly above your workpiece and you tuned up. Now in a minute I'm going to show you about a thing if you use your bandsaw to rip. Rip means you're kind of cutting something lengthways or you're resawing. You want bandsaws have what's called drift. Drift means that that blade although you think if you've got a fence on it like right here and your blade that everything's going to cut perfectly true like a table saw or something that's not the case band saws can kind of drift a little and i'll show you how to set that up and change it and make sure you got it right now this has got a quarter inch and you're going to see a terminology called tpi what does that mean that means teeth per inch Basic bottom line to it is the fewer teeth per inch, the more aggressive the cut, the faster it cuts. The gullets, which are the spaces in between the teeth, allows for better chip removal. And they also, again, are a little bit more aggressive. For, for most all of my band sawing, I use a three teeth per inch. Uh, I usually run a quarter inch blade. Now this is for scroll cutting and whatever. But as you'll see, one of the things we do is we'll take a bandsaw or a jigsaw and we saw close to our line and then we use 
an oscillating spindle sander to sand to the line. That's going to give you your most accurate and best finish. You have, in other words, you're going to have a whole lot better, smoother edge. You're going to be able to control it easier and whatever. If you're into resawing, again, and in our when we and when we do our drawers, you're looking at one of the things we like to do is our drawers are typically made with through dovetails, and then we do an applied front, and we explain that in the drawer segment. But resawing the wood, you know, I'm re I like to be able to get me, for example, if I'm doing like a chest of drawers or something, I'll buy something like some 12 quarter, which is three inches, or even some 16 quarter, which is four inches, and I'll take slices out of it for my drawer fronts. That way I've got a sequentially matched set of drawer fronts going up. Makes it beautiful. The other thing it does is when you're using nice wood, you don't ha rather than doing a through dovetail, I mean a half blind dovetail, you've only got to deal with the front. The other thing is, is if you get a little bit of an oops and that drawer ain't fitting just so so or whatever, when you can tune that up and then when you put your drawer front on, everything's in alignment. It's kind of a, it works really well. But the biggest reason we like it is we like to be able to do those sequentially matched drawer fronts. We also like, in many cases, to do what's called a book matched panel. What is that? I'm going to show you in a second. This bandsaw is a Laguna, and what we're running on it, this is a Morris, M O R S E, one inch. This happens to be a four teeth branch, but three would do just fine. And it's a carbide tip. Now, they're pricey. But if you do a lot of resawing, might be something you want to look at. But a lot of band saws are not going to accommodate a one inch. Now, the Morris also has a half. But Highland Hardware sells a resaw, I think, I, I don't know if it's called Wood Slicer, I, I don't remember the name of it. Anyway, it's Highland Hardware. They sell a resaw bandsaw. It's a little half inch, and it's about as nice as you're going to find. Is it as good as the bigger one inch with the carbide? No. But it does do a nice job, and it will work on your 14 inch or smaller bandsaws. Now, if you're into a lot of resawing, this, this this band sells a one and a half horsepower. This one's three. The three is pretty nice. Uh, particularly, you know, again, where we do a lot of hardwood like tiger maple, flame birch, and these kind of animals, you know, you want something that's, that's got some horsepower to it. Um, let's look at let's look at resawing. This is what's referred to as book matching. And it allows us to come up with some pretty unique designs and some. And again, if I was doing a drawer front, this would be one, this would be another, or I could turn it, whatever I wanted to do. And again, with the drawer fronts in particular, it saves a lot of wood. Um, I think. Again, it depends upon what you're doing. I'm just thinking out loud here. I still think the little quarter inch, three teeth per inch is probably the blade I use the most. Um, right, before I get into setting up the drift on this, I want to mention something. When you resaw wood, 
wood is, when you open it up, like we just did, the inside of that wood, it, it doesn't matter if it's kill dried, it doesn't matter how long it's been around. We've talked about this. The inside is never as dry as the outside. So what happens is when you open it up, that inside's going to dry a little bit. When that happens, when the moisture leaves it, that wood is going to contract. When it contracts, it's going to cup a little bit. It's going to try to. One of the things you can do is, number one, when you resaw it, let it acclimate a while, stack it, put sticks in between it, and clamp it to keep it flat. And just let it sit around your shop for a little while and dry. The other thing is, always resaw heavy. Meaning, if you want something a quarter, you probably really want to resaw it three eighths. That gives you room to flatten and level because resawing wood typically will move, especially when you've cut it. And the wider it is, more so. Okay, what I've done is I simply drew a line on this piece of wood. Equally spaced, just a straight line. Now I'm gonna start sawing it. Now this isn't too bad at all. But oftentimes what you're going to see is this wood's going to be setting in here this way or this way. But that's how it's tracking. That's the drift. And then what you want to do is you want to adjust, you know, this one I think is underneath here. You can adjust your fence to that angle. That's what compensates for drift. Now what I want to do is I want to draw out a scroll and then we're going to take the little 14 inch with the three teeth per inch blade and we're just going to cut out a little scroll. Then we're going to go look at an oscillating spindle sander to clean that up. All right, oscillating spindle sanders, they come in all kind of different sizes. This is a jet, this is a big floor model. This got about a nine inch drum on it. This is a real popular one. It's a little rigid from Home Depot, and it uh, does a pretty good little job. What's the oscillating part mean? As it's, now this one's set up with a uh, belt on it, but it also you can take this off and set it up with a drum just like we do on here on the big jet one. The only thing you have to do when you're doing scrolls is you match up your radiuses to your drum size. This is a three I have on here. quite a difference and how nicely refi refined how we sand to the line that's that sneak up on the thing that's that thing that lets you ease in to that final shape and it's so important so so important I mean that the spindle sanders uh, if you're doing much scroll work of any kind they're, they're just you need one you don't have to have a big one but you need one but now let's talk a little bit about a jigsaw. What's the difference and what's the advantage of a bandsaw over a jigsaw? Well, a jigsaw, 
doesn't have that bottom support. That's one major thing. Now, why is that a major thing? Because often a blade can twist one way or the other. And you have to be careful with that. But the other thing with a band jigsaw is you have every kind of blade you can think of. And it doesn't matter if you've got a little block and decker from Walmart. This is a fest tool. One of my favorites is a Bosch. You're going to see very aggressive blades. If you're cutting anything of any thickness whatsoever, you want a good, heavy blade. That bl that's going to keep that bait blade from flexing so much. You're also going to look for a jigsaw. If you look at this fest tool right here, kind of like a bandsaw there, it's got a guide. And again, that helps keep that from flexing. On the side of a jigsaw, you're going to see your on off. A lot of them will have a variable speed, but you're going to see a knob like this. This is what this does is this changes the pitch of the blade. And it can make it cut slower and it can make it cut faster and more aggressive. It just depends upon what you're doing. Most jigsaws have that. You know, for fine work, you can get little scroll saw blades. For fine radiuses. And that's something else, you know, the same thing with a bandsaw as with the jigsaw, the thickness of the width of the blade is going to dictate how type of radius you can turn. Um, we kind of usually use the Bosch jigsaw blades. And you're going to see the different jigsaw blades. They're going to have the top on it, how it's shaped is going to determine. Some of them have a little hole that you use a set screw with. Some of them are a little bit easier to change the blades in. This has just got a clip and it goes, it's locked. Now, there's something else you're going to notice. If you look at this blade, you see which way the teeth are angled? The teeth are angled up toward the saw. That means when this is down cutting in wood, it's exiting the chips onto the top. So it's going to give you a cleaner cut on the bottom than it is on the top. And you're going to see a lot of them that way. One of my favorites is to use is what's called a bimetal. And it's actually a metal cutting blade because the teeth are so fine. It's slower. So I'm going to have to take my adjustment here and arc my blade forward a little bit to make it a little bit more aggressive. But it's going to give a finer cut. You're going to see other blades that cut downward. This is going to give a cleaner cut on the top. It's a shear. It has it shearing. And the same thing when we talk about routers. Direction, you know, up cut, down cut. It makes a difference in how it's, you know, the, the cut is going down. So it's less likely to chip out on the top. If, if the teeth are coming up, it's more likely to cut out on the top. You know, if you're doing construction or something, this is a Bosch. It's called a progressor. It's just real aggressive. You're messing with two by four, stuff like that. You want something good and heavy like this. You're doing something like this popper we just did. You could get by with a sc little scroll blade, or you could get by with a little bimetal blade. Now, this is made for cutting metal, so it's a fine cut. And so it's not going to give you, even though it's, even though the teeth are coming up, it's going to give you a very fine line. Uh, again, leave the line, come back and sand to it. Always double check. One of the things with band, uh, jigsaws is they're bad about the foot rotating. And it's also, a lot of people have issues when they're trying to hold one. You know, you want to lock your wood down too. You don't want to be sitting out here trying to hold the wood because then you're rocking. 
and you do that, you don't get a vertical cut. You want to be able to sit down and you want that blade to be vertical. You want it to be 90 degrees to the, to the foot. Rough, rough breaking down sheet goods, you know, just doing a quick cut on something just to get it down to size and stuff where you're not real concerned about it being perfectly straight. They do well. But I'll tell you something else you can do with the jigsaw. Is you can take a straight edge clamp it down and use your jigsaw against it and you can get a pretty good cut. You can get a pretty straight cut. But again, make sure you've got a good blade in it. And, and the ones I prefer the most when I'm doing furniture or finish work is the one that the teeth are headed down are very fine.